Caroline Lucas is, of course, co-leader of the Green Party and um, Green MP in Brighton. Uh, Mary Honeyball is a London MEP for the Labour Party. And Tom Brake is a Lib Dem MP uh, in Surrey, who is also the party's spokesman for Brexit. So a good cross-party uh, mix of people to talk about Brexit and democracy. Um, and let me just kick off, I suppose, by asking you, Caroline, how important was the anti-Brexit vote in the 2017 election? That's incredibly hard to say, isn't it? Because the two main parties weren't offering very different visions of what Brexit would be like. I mean, I'm very glad that since then, Jeremy Corbyn has at least got as far as saying that we should remain in the customs union or a customs union, and we can have a long debate about pronouns, but nonetheless, that's a step forward. And I hope very much that he'll go fully forward and, and accept also the single market. And frankly, I think he should also accept the idea of a, a people's poll on the final deal so that people can have a look at the final detail of what's being proposed. And if they like it, well, by all means have it. But if we don't, then I think it's right that there should be a, a vote on that final deal. But in terms of trying to um, analyse the general election through the perspective of the Brexit vote, as I say, it's really hard because the two main parties basically breathed up all of the uh, available oxygen. They weren't really offering, at that point, very different visions of, uh, of Brexit. And to my mind, that was a huge betrayal of, of the many, many people that uh, would want to be able to vote for a party that uh, had more power than, sadly, the Greens currently do, or even, at the moment, the, the, the Lib Dems. Um, so I wouldn't want to say that, as some uh, Brexiteers do, that the fact that 80% of people voted for one of the two main parties, that in some way that was any kind of uh, uh, support for the kind of extreme Brexit that Theresa May is pursuing. I would still argue that she has absolutely no mandate for that kind of a Brexit when you're out of the single market, out of the uh, customs union, no freedom of movement. That was not on the ballot paper. And during the uh, referendum itself, the Brexit leaders were always very careful to be as vague as they possibly could be about what the destination looked like. So yes, the referendum was a, a vote on departure. It was not a vote on what kind of destination we wanted, and that was very deliberate, because as long as they left that as vague and as contradictory as possible, they would be more likely to get more people to vote in that referendum, thinking that uh, by voting for Brexit, they would get what they understood to be the result of Brexit. OK, and you mentioned um, yourselves and the Lib Dems not getting as many votes as people might have expected in that election. And, and let me just put that to you, Tom, because lots of people would say there was a vote for a softer form of Brexit in that election. But clearly, there was an overwhelming vote for two parties that were essentially saying, we are going to leave. That is going to happen. Do you think, therefore, that if we're talking about Brexit and democracy, that people have voted for it to be seen through? Well, no, I don't. Uh, of course, what happened in the, the 2017 general election is that uh, our Prime Minister indeed, did indeed try to make it uh, a, a general election about Brexit and about giving her more power, giving her a, a majority to deliver uh, Brexit. But in fact, the, the general election uh, ended up being a, a general election about, in many ways, the, the normal sorts of things that one talks about in an election campaign, such as funding for schools, and, of course, the dementia tax, which probably derailed the, the, the Tory campaign uh, above anything else. So I think although the Prime Minister tried to make it about the referendum, it, it didn't work out that way. I agree with Caroline that, uh, unfortunately, in that campaign, I think what happened was the, uh, because the two major parties were at, at uh, other ends of the political spectrum, it became a, a very polarised election. And people... I think a majority of people were making a choice about which of the other party they least favoured. I, I also think that uh, Labour, uh, and I apologise, there's a bit of a pincer movement going on in relation to the, the Labour representative here. I think Labour did manage to uh, present itself in certain parts of the country as a party that was uh, against Brexit, and in other parts of the country, a party that was in favour of Brexit. Uh, and uh, I suppose the final thing I would say is that uh, in relation to, to uh, the whole Brexit issue, uh, I'm afraid that, uh, that the blame for, for where we are needs to be equally shared by David Cameron and Jeremy Corbyn. Because? Well, because, 
because Je Jeremy people, Corbyn, Jeremy people, Corbyn did more events perhaps than any other politician, didn't he? Well, uh, pe people went. Labour supporters went into the EU referendum in 2016, not actually knowing what Labour Party's policy on it was, and that was because I think Jeremy Corbyn, uh, as we can see from repeated statements that he is making, has a very mixed view on it. Uh, sometimes he, he is supporting a customs union. Uh, and on other occasions, he's accusing the European Union of, for instance, getting in the way of him uh, nationalising the railways if he so wanted to do, which, in fact, the European Union uh, wouldn't be able to do. And, of course, so, Mary, we've got a situation where politicians always attack politicians of other parties. It tends to be what happens. But some would argue that on the issues relating to Brexit, and perhaps you could talk a bit about... EU citizens and protections in particular, given um, the focus of the conference today, we actually need some cross-bench working. To, to, how important do you think that is in terms of Brexit and the negotiations? Well, I think it's very important, and I have to say, before going on to say anything else, that I do agree, in fact, with most of what Caroline and Tom have said. And I always thought that the 2016 referendum itself should have been fought on a cross-party basis. And I think we might have got a different result if that had happened. Um, and this is not necessarily a party issue. I mean, whether or not we stay or leave the European Union is not the sole prerogative of any of the political parties. It happened to be a Conservative Prime Minister who called the referendum, but there were, despite what we're seeing now, there are a lot of Conservative MPs, and indeed I think some, maybe not quite so many proportionately Tory members, party members, who don't want to leave the European Union and certainly didn't at the time of the referendum. So this is not a black and white issue. This is actually a cross-party issue. And I think we should have recognised that from the very beginning. And I think it's a great tragedy that we didn't. And, of course, European citizens, you here, have been caught right in the middle of this. And I've been privileged during the course of all of this to talk to a lot of you and a lot of the groups representing you and know just how awful and how difficult this is for you now and potentially into the future. So I think what we need to do now really is come together on a cross-party basis and work as one to stop Brexit happening. And it's important... But Mary, that that's not the position of your party. No, I mean, no, I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm, this is very much my own view. Um, the problem, and we're talking about democracy in this, in, in this panel, the problem that we have with the British system is that it isn't actually very democratic. And when you compare it with the way we work in the European Parliament, where we do have cross-party working, where we do actually discuss and negotiate legislation, it's a very... And, and most European countries work on a, the European kind of model. So this is how Europe works. We are the ones that are different. And really, I think we're seeing more and more that the British system is failing us. What we have now, and I say this as a Labour representative, is that we do have two extremes in governing this country. We have an extreme government, because whatever Theresa May may be personally, and that's vague and opaque, what is happening now is an extreme form of government, and she is being led by the hard right of her party. And Jeremy Corbyn, of course, represents the hard left of the Labour Party. And I, I mean, I'm not giving away any secrets here. And there, it, we seem to have conceded, or something has happened with the process. So sensible people in the middle just aren't really being represented properly or in any way that we should be. And I think that's a huge failure of British democracy. On, 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 the, on the positive side, it, it's very clear that, first of all, the, the, well, since the EU referendum, it, in fact, there has been a huge amount of cross-party working. Uh, I've been a member of Parliament for nearly 21 years, and I can't recall any period apart from the last 12 months in which there has been this degree uh, of cross-party working. So there are uh, Liberal Democrat, Caroline Lucas for the Greens, and a number of Labour MPs and SNP, and occasionally the odd Conservative, uh, who w we work very constructively and very actively together uh, in terms of identifying amendments to bills, for instance, where, uh, for instance, the, the Dominic Grieve Amendment, so the amendment that came forward, the purpose of which was to ensure that Parliament has a, a meaningful vote, 
uh, was something where it was clear from the outset that the, the best chance of this getting through uh, was to uh, have Dominic Grieve leading it and bringing with him a number of Conservative MPs for then the other parties, the opposition parties, to support that, uh, but without leading from the front on, on the issue. So that, that cross-party working is going on, both from the point of view of activity in Parliament, and that is why we've seen... Uh, two bills that we were due to debate, the, the trade bill and the taxation bill, which we would expect to be debate, debating at the report stage now, but in fact the government have had to push it back till after the, the council elections because there have been amendments tabled to that bill by, again, Anna Soubry and Ken Clark, so Conservatives, which the opposition parties are supporting, uh, and it's on the issue of whether we should be in a customs union, uh, the government suddenly realised that they're at huge risk of losing. And, of course, if the government were to lose a vote uh, where Parliament would have said to the government, you have got to negotiate for us to be in a customs union, that completely demolishes the government's, the, our Prime Minister's negotiating position because she said we're not going to be in a customs union. And that's why they've had to run away from bringing these bills forward. Presumably they're working very hard behind the scenes now to try and neutralise that particular amendment because if they bring it forward, they risk losing. OK, and, and Caroline, we also talk about cross-party working at a more local level. It was interesting in the general election that you backed the Lib Dems, for example, in a seat like Richmond, but Labour didn't do that, and they got 2,000 votes, and a Brexiteer Conservative actually won that seat. Is that something that frustrates you, and do you think we could see a difference in the local elections that are coming up? Well, you're right. The, the, the Greens um, really were spearheading the idea of, of some kind of progressive alliance at the last general election, um, both to maximise the chances of getting MPs elected who would support proportional representation so that we could break open this horrendous electoral system that we have that has delivered exactly the, uh, uh, the kind of impacts that Mary outlined, but also so that we would reduce the chances of having uh, more MPs there who were backing this very extreme Brexit. And it does break my heart that, that in a sense, you, you know, the, the, the Labour Party in particular turned their back on it. The Lib Dems were uh, more constructive, and as a result, there are some... Uh, local elections, for example, coming up in Oxfordshire, where, where certain arrangements have been discussed, um, and in a couple of other areas too. I think you're right to say the local elections are, are, are going to be key, because obviously it's an election where EU citizens mostly can vote. So um, I'm hoping that, that people in this room will be bearing that in mind. I'm sure you will when it comes to, to, to May the 3rd. And, and the more that that message can get across, um, that, that you, you, you know, I, I appreciate that, that Brexit is not a primarily a local election issue, but nonetheless the impact of Brexit will be felt very much at a local level in terms of not having the famous £350 million for the NHS and to the contrary uh, it's going to cost us a lot of money under every single impact assessment that Theresa May was trying to stop people from seeing, but if, we, if you actually now do look at what's been put in the public domain, as you know, every single one of them sees Britain becoming worse off. It is quite extraordinary to me that we have a government that is actually proudly proclaiming that they are deliberately choosing a policy that will impoverish the country. Isn't, I mean, we have gone into the, a bit of a madness here. But, it, but isn't, didn't the referendum result, to some extent, mean that voters were choosing, essentially, certain types of sovereignty, including over immigration, above the economy? I mean, nobody was suggesting, nobody was suggesting in that, well, apart from Boris Johnson, perhaps, but if, the Remain campaign was quite clear that there would be an economic hit. Yes, but, the, but I don't think um, that, that that trade-off was, 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 was widely accepted in, in the sense that, you know, you have freedom of movement and you're, and you're poorer or, or, or not. I mean, that, that wasn't the proposal, and, 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 and rightly so. So I think, I think you can't draw the conclusion that, that the majority of people chose to impoverish themselves. You'll remember that every time that the Remain campaign did try to set out some of the economic impacts of this, uh, they were shouted down by the Leave campaign. Having said that, I do have to admit that I think the Remain campaign was pretty rubbish. And I say that as somebody who was part of it and tried to influence it, but I don't think it was a good campaign. You don't put the Prime Minister and the Chancellor in head of a, ahead of a campaign that you want to win when you know that there's an awful lot of anger against exactly those two people uh, and at a government where people will take the opportunity to give what they see as the establishment a very large kick, and that's exactly what happened. And, and Mary, in the local elections, London is going to be a really big deal, all eyes on London. Um, you clearly want to stop Brexit, your party doesn't, so where does that leave voters in London, for example, who feel very passionately about Brexit? 
Well, it is local elections, um, as we've already said. It's not an election about Brexit. I mean, I think you're right. I think the Labour Party is going to win seats, and particularly in London. And we should never forget um, that London voted Remain, and which is one of the reasons that I feel able to say the things that I do say, because I feel I'm representing London. Um, so it, it will be different here. London will be a big deal, and London will get a good result. But these are local elections, and Caroline's absolutely right, of course, that Brexit Brexit will have an impact. Brexit will have an impact on local council the London borough budgets and what they can spend. Um, Tom talked about the dementia tax, which of course, were it, had it happened, it would be administered by local authorities. So actually, certainly in London, it would be under London borough social services and maybe different in other parts of the country. So there are issues in the, the local elections, which will be affected by Brexit, but they are essentially local elections. But, however, as EU citizens can have a vote, I don't see there's any, any problem in raising Brexit at local elections because of the impact that it will have on local communities. So, I, no, no, it, it's a forum which could be used to talk about Brexit, and I think that that is something that would be very legitimate to do. And I think we should we should certainly do that. Um, and if we do that, of course, it does become much more of a Brexit election. And I think certainly in certain parts of the country, and certainly in London, we ought to consider campaigning like that. And all of you turning out to vote, please. Um, Tom, very quickly, and then I'll then I, we've only got five minutes, but I'll then quickly. Yeah, take some so just just on local campaigning. So uh, as a party, the Lib Dems, we are doing quite a lot of work in terms of, for instance, putting out videos in in uh, different the twenty probably all twenty seven EU languages in terms of the, uh, the the local election campaign to reinforce the point that this is an election in which EU citizens can vote. Of course. We as a party, and indeed Caroline, supported the idea that in the EU referendum, EU citizens should be able to vote, and uh, UK citizens living in the EU and 16 and 17 year olds, but that was not allowed, unfortunately. Uh, just I wanted to very briefly on the Progressive Alliance. I think the difficulty with Progressive Alliance is that uh, is, are, are all elements, for instance, of the Labour Party progressive? There's a question mark about that. Uh, uh, clearly, there's a question they mark might, about... They may say that about Lib Dems as well. well. They may say that, <laughs> indeed. They may say that about Lib Dems as well. And clearly, the, the progressive uh, elements of the Conservative Party are not that numerous. So, uh, And in a seat like mine, where my main challenge are, are, are challenges are the Conservatives, if there was a progressive alliance, for instance, that involved Labour and the Greens, what does that say to Conservative voters in my seat? about who they should be voting for. So it's not quite as straightforward as, as perhaps people think, but on something like the vote on the deal. So if we manage to secure a vote on the deal, a popular vote, then I think the case for having a, call it a progressive alliance if you want, or an alliance of all the, all the parties, all the people in the different parties that want to stop a Brexit, having a progressive alliance that would fight that campaign much more effectively than the stronger in campaign, which we as a party tried to get in on the act in terms of having different voices. I'm sure that uh, Caroline tried to as well, but it was locked down in terms of the only people who could speak were uh, George Osborne and, and David Cameron. Uh, but having a, a cross-party group which might actually have a, a, a manifesto in effect, because the one thing that is certain about what's happened since Brexit is that the, the people who voted for Brexit, none of their concerns, certainly their concerns about poor housing, uh, a lack of jobs, poor skills training, uh, poor infrastructure, absolutely none of those have been addressed by the present government. And the idea, perhaps, that a, a progressive alliance would actually put forward a platform that appeals to some of their concerns, as well as explaining why we should stay in the EU, I think would be a very positive thing. I've had no time to questions. I was going to take two quick contributions. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, you've got 20 seconds each. So, <laughs> go on, gentlemen there. 20 seconds, honestly, I'm is coming what you've with got. a microphone. Sorry. Oh, where's the microphone? Oh, Wait. From my point of view, it's fine. So don't do it from my point It's coming, it's coming. One sec, then everyone can hear you. I'm just asking the all three MPs that you have rightly pointed out that 2016 referendum, as you say, it was... Uh, it was conceded by um, Cameron uh, because of the hard right Brexit forced him to do that. And the 2016 um, referendum also, Nigel Farage, you remember, he said that he, 
He might be thinking that he would be losing the election. He said that there is a possibility of second referendum. And 2017 general election, Theresa May was begging for hard Brexit, and it was rejected. Now, my question is, in the, on the con context of Brexit and democracy, any second referendum is a part of democratic process after the final deal, because it appears that by 29th of March 2019, she can only achieve hard Brexit, and which is rejected by, by the general election 2017. Okay, um, this gentleman. And I okay, and a woman maybe. This gentleman then, and that's it. That's all we're gonna have time for. This gentleman here at the front. I've been told. <laughs> this right. is an issue not of concerns, but of consent. What we need to get is consent to go ahead with the final solution. Just like in sex. Because otherwise, if you don't have consent just before the act, it's right, and we're being screwed. <laughs> OK. Um. <laughs> so, so, so I guess those are quite similar questions, and maybe you can all address them in a minute each. And I guess I would put to you, just in addition to that, a lot of people talk about the will of the people mm. at the last referendum. I mean, do you think that that referendum was undemocratic? Uh, Tom. Well, um, I, I agree with uh, David Davis on this issue that, you know, if a democracy can't change its mind, then it's not a democracy. Uh, and clearly, yes, the will of the people was expressed on the 23rd of June 2016. However, certain facts have emerged. Uh, and what is clear from the polls and the trends is that the public have actually changed their minds. And in those circumstances, I think it is a government's, it, it is the, the responsibility of the government uh, to look at people's concerns and reflect those and not, as uh, Caroline said a few moments ago, willfully and purposefully pursue something that they know is going to damage every single sector and every single region of the country. Okay. And Very can I just finish by saying, uh, si la question est est-ce que je dois rester ou est-ce que je dois partir, la réponse est je dois rester, bien sûr. You're yeah. showing off now. <laughs> Well, I never accepted that the referendum was the will of the people. Um, I mean, it, the thing is, it's gone down as a legend that it now is the will of the people. Um, I mean, I, I'm very dubious about referendums under our system because we don't have them very often. And so we're not used to them. We're not like Switzerland and countries that have them all the time. So it's an event which we don't quite know how to deal with. And it was very close. And none of you, I mean, I'm assuming most of you here are EU citizens. Those of you who are EU citizens, which I'm sure is the majority here, could not vote in it. And it was very close. Um, the actual margin between 48 and 52 in terms of numbers of people, which would have made a difference, was 600,000. That was 600,000 voters out of an electorate of about 40 million. That is not the will of the people. And I'm afraid it's gone down in, in sort of folklore now that it is the, was the will of the people. And it wasn't really challenged enough at the time, I think. So I think there's a huge constitutional problem here over the way it was done. But we're probably stuck with it now. Um, but I think... What we can argue, and should be arguing, as, as both Tom and Caroline said, that we now want a referendum on, on the final deal, uh, because people weren't told, all people were told was, you know, you get th £350 million pounds more for the NHS every week, which quite clearly isn't happening. The NHS is now saying that, that Brexit is going to actually put them in real danger of collapse. You know, this is the polar opposite of what they were led to believe, and there are many other examples of that. So I think we've got grounds on various levels and various questions to go back and do, as David Davis, as comes quite right, says, you know, democracy, you can change your mind. It's not changing your mind necessarily. It's now voting on the reality of what's happening. Caroline? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a bit boring, because I'm going to agree, I'm afraid, but essentially... Um, the will of the people is not a settled thing, as, as, as the others have said. It's something that changes over time, and particularly in the light of information. And given the extra information people now have, compared to what they had in June 2016, it's not surprising that people now might like to have uh, a, you know, an, a, another look at the facts. It's like having been promised that you were going to be moving house to this wonderful mansion, and in fact you're offered a pretty you know, 
pokey hovel with, with, with faulty wiring and no plumbing, and you have a look at it, and you think, actually, I'm not necessarily sure that's where I want to go. So you should have the right to have that say. I think calling it a second referendum is problematic because it gives the impression that we think that the first referendum was somehow you know, wrong and people got it wrong. I think that will alienate the very people that we need to try to persuade to think differently. So I would prefer to call it a, you know, a poll, a people's poll on the, on the final deal. Um, I think that, um, that in particular, um, it's, it's, it's necessary because if you, if you, another way of putting what, what Mary was saying is that, in fact, it was only 37% of the total electorate that actually voted to leave, which, which, I mean, how is this the will of the people for all time? It wasn't. And I just wanted to end by saying that the, the people that I also feel very, very sorry for and my heart goes out to is, is not only EU citizens, but it's also young people, 16-year-olds who were not allowed to vote. I do think it was an, an unforgivable act of, of intergenerational theft essentially, for, for younger people who are going to be living longest with the impacts of this decision not to have had their say on it. And I would argue very, very strongly that in the future, 16-year-olds should have the right to vote because yeah, yeah. they're going to be living with the impacts of this for longest. Okay. Thank you.